in the 21st century Hardworking people Working hard for you and me Moving higher Time and time again Through the years you'll find us here Moving higher Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast number 172. This week my guest is Tanner Emke and Tanner is with the uh, co-bank. He is the manager of the Knowledge Exchange over there and this edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Dawson Tire and Wheel, your premier ag tire and wheel provider in North America, helping people grow. Well, Tanner, needless to say, there's, uh, there's uh, a lot of stuff to talk about this week. There's all kinds of stuff going on around the world. That is this. Uh, that is an understatement, Casey. <laughs> it's been a crazy week. It's been a it's been bizarre that. week. Yeah, it has been that. So let's lay out here what's kind of happened. So the coronavirus has has kind of hit a fever pitch across uh, the whole world, for that matter. Um, yeah. Almost everything in the United States has been canceled. There's nothing going on. Um, I don't know if this is the first yeah. time or not, but the uh, NCAA tournament got canceled. Uh, <laughs> any, anything and everything sports related has been canceled. Um, it's just, I, I mean, everything's been canceled. Nothing. Broadway got canceled. I mean, it just canceled everything that that could be uh, that could be out there. And then throw that out there, yeah. and then throw on top of that um, the uh, all the OPEC countries got together and decided they were going to um, decrease production a little bit to raise prices up and. Russia said, uh, no, we're not going to do that. And so Saudi Arabia said, cool, we'll just flood the market with oil and we'll break you until you decide that you want to you want to fall in line. And um, that you saw yeah. a 30% decline in the price of oil across the world, which had just wreaked havoc on top of the stock market anyway. And you put all this stuff together uh, with what's going on in the ag economy across the world, and this didn't help anything. So I guess uh, yeah. give, give me your... Uh, your your view from from an economist standpoint of of what you see happening right now and 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 is this uh is this going to take longer to fix than what people think? Yeah, well, I mean, Casey, you've hit uh, the two big items this week that uh, are causing a lot of uncertainty and uh, you know really a risk off type of mentality across all the markets. You know, whether you're talking about stocks, bonds, commodities, you name it, uh, it's a risk off. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of fear. Yeah, people are just scared about what's going on. But think about all of the other things going on. We have, uh, you know, leading into all these issues with coronavirus and then uh, the energy wars between uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia. We had all these trade tensions coming into this, uh, trade uncertainty. Uh, we had, um, you know, a continuing tight labor market, which is going to get even tighter, perhaps. If you look at what's going on specifically with the livestock markets right now, I mean, livestock, uh, looking at just like cattle and hogs, uh, they are really getting hard, uh, hammered hard uh, because not just of economic consequences of people perhaps consuming less meat because they're trying to you know do social distancing by not going to restaurants and not eating meat, uh, and what have you. There's also the economic impact of people are making less money. They're perhaps going to eat less meat. But then there's the other direct effects. We can't get a workforce to show up uh, to the packing facility. You know, what, what if you, don't, you can't uh, process all the cattle and hogs and chickens because your workers are all calling in sick? And mm-hmm. so, the you know, agriculture is really dealing, a lot, uh, dealing with a lot right now, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, a lot of direct and indirect impacts that the markets are trying to sort out in all of this, uh, really a cacophony of fear. Uh, and so it's it's a crazy, bizarre week. Uh, and I'd say, you know, that we have to keep in mind, though, that amidst all this fear and volatility, uh, the coronavirus is going to pass. Uh, and right. It will be just a matter of weeks. You know, health officials in the U.S. are saying, they anticipate uh, a cresting of new cases in the United States to happen in the next six to nine weeks. Um, that's a positive because we're already seeing over in China where uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, uh, started from in Wuhan, China. Uh, they've already crested, and the number of new cases in China has been declining. Now, the number of overall cases 
has been increasing, but the pace of uh, growth of the uh, of new cases is declining, and that's a positive. So they've got. It appears as though the Chinese have it under control. Now, outside of China, it's a bit of a different story. Uh, the World Health Organization here just this week, uh, really yesterday, I think it was, uh, declared it uh, officially a pandemic, which means it's a global crisis. And you know, how do you, how do you get ahead of that? How do you stop it? Well, you've got so many different countries with varying levels. Uh, degrees that are ability to respond to it or to get ahead of it. And so uh, once it's now an epidemic, it, it, ra- it just raises the uncertainty even more. You mentioned all these conferences get, getting canceled. I've got two or three conferences that I was going to go to here uh, uh, in the next few weeks that have been canceled. And these are important conferences for agriculture where we get together and, you know, a network with our peers and talk about what's going on in the industry and the markets. And so those, that's another unintended, uh, or another, uh, outlying effect that, you know, in the agricultural industry is that, you know, we have less knowledge perhaps of what's going on out there because we're not sharing the knowledge as much, uh, with all these canceled conferences. Now people are going to work around these uh, issues one way or another. Uh, there's a lot of people that are, um, Staying home to work, and you know, we're just not going to uh, be be working closely together. But you know, we'll as time goes on after this thing is uh, all over with. I'm sure people are going to look at back at this and say, "What the heck was this?" And it'll be studied for quite some time about the uh, the uh, the impacts of a global pandemic. But uh, on Russia and uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia, in the midst of all this pandemic. Uh, uncertainty. Now you got, now you have Saudi Arabia and Russia picking a fight, and uh, Saudi Arabia trying to punish the Russians uh, for not playing ball and uh, wanting to reduce uh, production. So as you mentioned, uh, prices are down. Uh, with it, we're off about thirty percent in literally in a matter of seconds in the, in the, on tra- of trading. Just it dropped in less than a minute. And if you look at what's happened though. So far for the entire year since January, uh, crude oil, West Texas International Crude Oil, that's down 53% uh, from the high in uh, in January. And uh, gasoline prices down 55%. Ethanol prices down 17%. So agriculture didn't get hit as hard there. But nonetheless, when you've got energy prices down, that's going to drink crude oil price, or uh, ethanol prices down, that's going to perhaps... Um, squeeze uh, that will squeeze uh, profit margins for your ethanol producers, and that might might impact uh, how much uh, their daily grind is. So there will be some uh, uh, some um, you know effects on agriculture uh, through that uh, channel as well. Other outside of just the, the sheer force of crude oil dragging down commodity markets, because in the commodity uh, indexes. Uh, energy has a very large impact. So when energy drops as fast as it does, it kind of uh, causes a cascade effect of selling because if, let's say, a a hedge fund or some other managed money institution uh, is selling off crude oil, then they could be selling off other commodities as well. So there's that cascading effect uh, of uh, crude oil pulling down other commodity markets like uh, grain and uh, livestock. So Really, the the total damage here from everything that's going on is really kind of hard to quantify. Uh, is it direct? Is it indirect? Is it financial uh, volatility? Is it what is going on? Well, it's all of these things happening all at once, causing this cratering effect across the markets. And you know, we're not going to get any certainty here, uh, and that's what markets desire. Uh, the, the enemy of uh, markets is uncertainty, and man, we have a lot of that going on right now. And we're, we're not going to get any firmer footing, really, until we understand the that uh, the COVID-19 uh, is under control or that it has crested in the United States uh, and it has crested globally. At that point, then we can have some certainty and we'll probably have a return to normalcy. But uh, until then, we're probably going to be in the state of um, extreme volatility uh, for at least the next few weeks. Yeah. Okay, so now that that brings me up to this next point. So there's been, um, fr- from just an economy standpoint, from just the straight up overall economy, 
when you're looking at um, the Federal Reserve and other central banks, the U.S. Federal Reserve uh, yesterday or the day before issued uh, half a billion dollars in um, uh, in available loans to stimulate the marketplace. It's yeah. the same thing today. Again, uh, banks have not taken advantage of that money. I think when I was listening to Bloomberg on the way in, they they basically taken um, advantage of about a hundred million dollars of that one trillion dollars that's out there um, yeah. for availability. Other central banks around the world have done similar things um, with about the same level of of participation. We have all this money getting pumped into the marketplace, but no one's really doing anything. Is that? I, I guess what's your what's your translation of all that when you when you hear that kind of those kind of numbers getting thrown around and no one's really participating even in that in that level? Yeah. I'd say it goes back to a lot of fear. From what I understand, what's going on when the Fed decided to inject uh, all this liquidity into the marketplace? A fancy word of saying dumping cash uh, right. into the market. So. Uh, so to incentivize uh, transactions and business, ease of ease of doing business, um, and, it, and people aren't picking it up. I think that's uh, really showing a sign of fear, because from what I understand, uh, what was happening is that uh, people trying to sell bonds were not finding buyers, and that and we're talking about the most liquid markets in the world, and you can't find buyers. Right. That's pretty odd. That is not no. common. And it's probably, I think it's endemic of the extreme level of cautiousness and fear uh, that's in the marketplace right now. And perhaps the FUD just does not have the tools, really, to, to combat that. Uh, it's just going to, again, it goes back to the market needing confidence that the, that the pandemic has crested. And uh, yeah. can the Fed, does the Fed have a lever on that? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, they, I mean, they, they can offer these loans. Uh, perhaps the government can offer uh, a trust fund or something like that uh, to to help support some of these businesses that are going to be hit really, really hard. You know, some of these other businesses, especially like airlines and uh, cruise ships, uh, you know, because they're they've got all these assets and nobody wants to travel. So that this might that might be one way to just support these businesses in the midst of all this lack of liquidity and just kind of hunker down and wait till the hailstorm passes and then we just kind of go back to business as normal. So the fear thing, I don't know if liquidity is going to resolve that. The only way to resolve that really is to is for the pandemic to crest. So, yeah. it, you know, when you look at, you see what's happening with consumers hoarding toilet paper. <laughs> it's, right. just, yeah. it's ridiculous. I mean, people yeah. are resorting to uh, really bizarre behavior. I mean, I get it. You got to have toilet paper, but I hear these anecdotal stories of people going, you know, coming home from Costco with an entire pallet of toilet paper. I mean, it's just senseless, and yeah. you're not going to get any. You're not going to get that normal, logical uh, consumer behavior back until we're, we're, we're through this thing. And so, yeah. I think that's you know two indications there. That uh, you know what you're seeing in the bond market and the liquidity has not had the desired effect that it thought it thought it would, um, and you get consumers you know, doing panic buying of certain con- consumer products. It, it's just senseless kind of activity, but that's what you have when you when you're in an extreme state of fear. Yeah. Okay. So here we are. Um, you know, they started planting in you know southern Texas, and they've kind of working their way north up where I'm at here. We're probably, well, we're probably 25 days, you know, 15 to 30 days, somewhere in that range, away from really being ready to, to plant, um, start planting corn. Um, yeah, you take a look at the marketplace right now. Um, if we're if we're six to nine weeks away from really knowing what we've got on our hands and what we don't have on our hands. Um, these markets are going to continue to puke uh, every day. It seems like there's a, there's a rapid sell-off and a rapid buy. Like today, for example, you know, you've had it started up a thousand points, and I don't know, I don't know where it's finished at, but it was. But even one last time I heard um, at about about noon or so um, East Coast time, so uh, you're kind of seeing these wild swings in the market. There's some talk about. Um, that Trump's going to declare a state of emergency or something like that. I've heard that on two or three different news outlets today. Yeah. 
plenty of stuff going on there. So I guess as you start taking a look at what's happening in the marketplace, um, obviously phase one of the China deal is going to be going to be on hold. I guess what's your prediction yeah. here as you start looking out here mm-hmm. and stuff going on? What, I guess what's your thought process moving into uh, the plant uh, early planting season yeah. for uh, for corn in the U.S. Uh, well, that's, that's what it all comes down to, right? Uh, what are, how is this going to affect, uh, planting decisions? How is this going to, you know, right. obviously we've got some market impact here. Um, you know, the farmers going to plant a crop. Uh, you know, that's that irrespective right. of market conditions, farmers always plant a crop. We always seem to do it. Right. The only thing that can really stop a farmer from doing that is the weather. Like we saw last year, Casey, I mean, you know, I remember right. what, where that was. Uh, yeah. That was the only oh, yeah. thing to stop a farmer is uh, a muddy field, and uh, so assuming that we're the you know farmers are going to continue to go forward with their plans uh, to put uh, put a crop on the ground, we can just talk about corn and beans for a minute. You know the the price ratio of corn of soybeans to corn is uh, two point four four right now. Anything above two four tends to uh, favor corn. And that's what USDA was indicating in their Ag Outlook earlier this year, uh, released a few weeks ago. Uh, we're going to have uh, about 94 million acres of corn, uh, what, 85, 86 million acres of soybeans, both significant increases over last year, and a lot of that coming out of wheat. Uh, wheat acres can continue to atrophy in the U.S. So uh, we're going to assume that irrespective of what happens in the marketplace, we're going to see an increase in corn and soybean acreage And, you know, when it comes down to the economy, though, how much, you know, what's the margin for the farmer? Obviously, when we've got uh, lower commodity prices, that's going to compress the margin on each bushel grown. Uh, I will point out, though, um, I was just in Burlington, Colorado yesterday uh, talking with uh, the U.S. Grains Council, and uh, I saw this this one farmer uh, had pointed out that, you know, interest rates are extremely low. They're record low. Right. And he said, you know, I can refinance, refinance my cow herd and, you know, take a whole point and a half off of his interest rate. And doing that right there really uh, creates a lot of financial cushion. You know, it's a lot, you know, eases up your yep. monthly payments or whatever you owe the bank. And then it you know, creates more uh, cash for you to, uh, to operate on. So there is a positive here. So although we've got some, a lot of uncertainty here and commodity prices are down, farmers are going to be heading into the growing season, Not, you know, they're not going to be optimistic about the current price uh, situation. Um, but, you know, the, having the lower interest rate environment is very, very helpful. Now, the long-term outlook, you already mentioned, uh, you know, phase one with China. Now, that was already viewed very skeptically by the market ahead of the whole coronavirus deal. Because the day the phase one uh, deal was signed with uh, China, the markets were actually down that day. And the reason being is that, uh, one, the Chinese had pledged uh, that they were going to buy about $36.5 billion of uh, agricultural products from the U.S. in 2020, which is an astronomical amount. Uh, I think the the high watermark we ever achieved with China was back in 2013, had about $29 billion. And th- that was in a time when we had record high uh, soybean prices. Well, we don't have record high soybean prices anymore. So how do you get those high watermark levels? How do you drive, how can you get uh, a, you know, such high numbers on imports, t- import totals on a dollar figure when commodity prices are low? So the, the market was already very skeptical of that. And not to mention... Uh, in that agreement, the Chinese had stated that the U.S. has to be price competitive uh, in order for them to buy. In order for them to, to meet their obligations, the U.S. has got to be competitive. Well, right there, it basically says the Chinese will buy from us when they feel like it. Right. They're not going to buy at non-competitive rates. So we already had that uh, uh, baked into the marketplace and I think what the, the positive there, and I don't want to get too negative here, Casey, but let's celebrate, so let's celebrate a positive here. The signing of the Phase 1 agreement ended the trade war, basically. It stopped the escalation of tariffs, and it reduced tariffs. And it opened market access for U.S. poultry, U.S. beef. So, let, I mean, I don't want to be 
uh, too negative on it. There's definitely some positives with the phase one agreement. But going forward in 2020, uh, there's some, there's a lot of doubt that the U.S., that the Chinese are going to be able to hit those, uh, these really high totals of purchases. And, uh, USDA even said at the, uh, uh, Ag Outlook conference that total U.S. Ag exports for 2020 are going to be about 14 billion. Uh, that's not very much. That's, that would be an increase, uh, over last year, but it's not near uh, the amounts that would be pledged by uh, China. So um, I would say now that you have even more uncertainty because of the coronavirus and uh, China's inability, or China's struggling with, uh, you know, economically because of, the, uh, because of this disease rampant across the country, that brings that their ability to meet those obligations even further into question, uh, no doubt. Uh, and so... Yeah, what what does the phase one agreement mean for 2020? Um, I don't think the marketplace really believes much of anything at this point. Uh, because of what was stated in the agreement, that the U.S. has to be price competitive, and now that the Chinese are struggling with the coronavirus, uh, there's a lot of doubts that that could actually be fulfilled. Right. Okay, so that kind of, kind of leads into my next question here. When you're looking at... So China's starting to turn the corner a little bit. They are already tapping into all kinds of strategic reserves anyway uh, before the coronavirus thing took place when it comes to, to pork and other other stuff that's out there. Um, do you think they could come to the table here in the next six weeks or so and say, hey, we're going to take a big list of, of whatever you got because we need to replenish some stuff because we really haven't had anything coming in and out of our country um, to really do one to kind of resupply what they have taken out of strategic reserves anyway and also kind of flood the market a little bit with some some different products? Yeah, that's the hope. Uh, Now that, uh, you know, you have all these consumers um, that have been at home for a long time, they're going to be waiting to get out, uh, head out to restaurants. They're going to be waiting to start returning to normalcy. You know, they're definitely going to be wanting to uh, increase their animal protein uh, consumption. And, you know, there was a lot of U.S. Uh, animal protein shipments sitting in port over China that were not lo- unloaded because people were not showing up. That was a direct impact uh, on U.S. agriculture, on uh, especially the U.S. meat industry. Now that we have, we're potentially going to see some easing of that here very soon, very shortly. Then, yeah, that's definitely a positive. Here in the weeks forthcoming, um, you know, the hope is that uh, they can start to rebuild. Uh, their uh, their animal protein inventories and uh, start uh, selling uh, like they used to. But, again, it comes down to um, you know, what is our ability to export. Going back to the issue of are we going to have the packers fully online in the United States you know, processing these animals and sending that meat over to China when we're dealing with coronavirus now and perhaps when we have workers not showing up to the plant to process all these animals. So that is the huge unknown still on our shores uh, right. that, uh, that we're still waiting to see play out. Assuming the stars align, uh, assuming that workers will show up the uh, processing facilities and, uh, to, to, to process all the cattle and hogs and poultry, uh, if that happens, uh, in our lucky, if we're lucky, uh, then, yeah, we're going to have a lot of product that we're going to need to export, and hopefully the Chinese will be in a position to purchase. Now, here recently, the Chinese uh, had the lowest export or import total on record, I believe, of pork. This is coming right after uh, record imports from the United States because they're dealing with African swine fever, right? Right. You know, they have, you know, half of their hog herd basically disappeared in very short order, and so uh, the price of pork, I think, there is about four times the price of pork in the United States. The price of a hog is about $400 a head. So they are trying desperate, desperately to rebuild a herd, but they're still dealing with high reinfection rates. Uh, and they're probably going to be dealing with African swine fever for quite some time. So we can probably anticipate that the Chinese are going to be strong buyers uh, again, here in the future, and that, that will be a positive. But again, it comes back to what's happening on our shores. Are we going to be able to ship out all the meat, uh, or ship any meat if the packers uh, are not processing? So that that'll be an unknown. Yeah, that's my kind of my next kind of talking about long term effects here. 
So as as you know, China obviously is where it started. So if there's going to be any anywhere that's going to show uh, uh, recovery quicker, just as far as less people getting sick and those kind of things happening, it's obviously going to be China and uh, you know that area of Asia that that they're uh, okay that's been infected first. Um, what are some of the long term effects that you see, you could see from something like this happening? Yeah, longer term, uh, well, there's going to be a hangover effect for sure. Uh, consumer habits are going to change, um, perhaps. I mean, people don't adopt new habits. Uh, they may just be, they may uh, decide to not go out less. They may find out that they don't need to go to restaurants as much as they used to. Uh, that the consumer behavior could be uh, altered. Um, but, you know, and that would have a direct impact on animal protein sales. Um, but I think longer term here, you know, just looking at the economy in general, uh, you've got uh, a lot of uh, expectations for the world economy to head into recession. Uh, expectations now that the U.S. economy will head into recession, and that'll last for a couple of quarters. And um, you know that will uh, impact consumers. Now, is, what's the impact going to be? Let's say, for instance, on grain production, uh, it's not so. That's not going to be a direct impact. It would be more uh, the impact of once the uncertainty lifts, then we can probably see an improvement in grain prices, hopefully, uh, just because uh, we'll see a spillover effect perhaps from uh, investors pushing money back into the marketplace. Uh, that, might be an opp- that might be an opportunity for farmers and ram- ranchers uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, capitalize on that. Uh, but really the long-term impacts here are hard to, hard to get your hands around because – there's, you know, there's still so many unknowns. We don't know how bad the coronavirus is going to be. Now, we can anticipate that Saudi Arabia and Russia are going to be duking it out for a little while. And on the side, you know, the United States is going to be impacted by this as well. You know, crude oil prices here in the United States are going to be suffering. So, and that is going to be dragging down, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that's going to drag down commodity prices in the United States. So as long as... Um, Saudi Arabia can, and uh, Russia continue uh, battling it out on uh, energy production. That's going to have an impact, but how long are they going to be able to do that? They have a pain threshold, too. And w- one day, that's going to have to end. And one day, the uh, coronavirus is going to peak. But really here, Casey, there's so many unknowns. What are the timelines on that? Uh, nobody really knows. And so uh, trying to uh, put together a long-term view is really hard. But uh, I'd say in the really long term, we, we all know uh, coronavirus will, will peak in the next few weeks or months, and uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia are going to call, have to call a truce because the pain will be too much for them to endure this for many, many months and year, definitely not many, many years. So um, my outlook is more pain. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to keep it uh, just to keep it high level, there we're gonna we're there's so much uncertainty that we're gonna see things will probably be getting worse before they get better. So I think uh, you know trying to put a timeline on it that is really difficult. I I, I hesitate to do that though. I, I'd say at least for the next few weeks to months, uh, we're gonna see some market pain for sure. All right, so let's talk about the Russian economy and the, you know, so much of their economy is driven by oil. Um, and yeah. if they slip into a, a recession or a depression because of this, and and there becomes some some major issues, the the dominance that the Black Sea region has has been here uh, as far as as wheat production goes, and and how the how the Russian economy will will play into those areas of of Ukraine and, and Kazakhstan and and all the areas there where there's a lot of a lot of wheat production. Um, even into Western Europe, we start looking at what's happened with uh, with France and their their wheat production. You know, do you foresee some some kind of uh, assuming that something happens with Russia, right? Uh, economically, there's, they slip into a, uh, a like I said, a, re- a recession or a depression of some sort. How do you see that affecting the wheat production in that area? Well, it would have the opposite effect of well, what you what we would naturally think would happen. Uh, because of their currency. So uh, because you know, Russia is a petrostate, uh, just like Saudi Arabia, and so their currency follows very closely to the price of oil. 
And so when you have uh, really cheap oil, uh, you're going to have a very, very cheap Russian ruble. So what does that do for their exports? It makes their exports yeah. very, very competitive. Attractive. Uh, yeah. Very attractive versus the United States. And so I would say, you know, they, you know, their product, I think USDA said their, uh, their total exports this year are going to be down uh, a little bit versus uh, the prior year. And, uh, you know, I think that was mostly due to their just uh, to overall production capacity was down. But, uh, I think, uh, when you've got such a, a weak currency, that's going to make it really hard for the U.S. to compete against Russia. Uh, they're going to be moving out wheat at a lot cheaper rate than we are. Uh, and it's not just Russia. Look at what's going on in Brazil. Uh, the Brazilian right. uh, economy is also uh, in a concerning state. I think if you look at the uh, Russia, or the, excuse me, the Brazilian real, um, it has really gone haywire because it was rumored that their president had uh, had COVID nineteen, and so the markets responded. But without that, uh, the Brazilian real was also record cheap versus the dollar, and that's very friendly for Brazilian exports. It's a headwind. Uh, for the United States. So on both of those export hubs in Brazil and Russia, they're dealing with very, very weak currencies because of both of these uh, these uh, black swan events, uh, COVID-19 and the energy war. And so you know they're just affecting both countries differently, but the consequences are the same. Their currencies get really, really cheap, and therefore their, ex- their exports get really, really competitive versus the United States. So that is going to be a headwind uh, to the S for sure. I would I would be out, though, um, you know, the exports for uh, the United States have been uh, positive, especially on wheat, uh, up 10% oh, compared to last year. So, again, let's try to find a, a positive story here. Our exports have improved because, you know, they're uh, historic. I think uh, the Russians had a some headwinds on their exports because of production problems, but also over in Australia and some of the problems you mentioned over in France. So we've picked up some business, uh, but now this week, the last few weeks, kind of changed things a little bit because of the currency issue. Uh, we're going to be having a harder time competing on the export front. Well, plenty of uh, plenty of good stuff going on here, Tanner. Um, all kinds of stuff oh, to keep yeah. your eye on. <laughs> right, I tell you what, I've... <laughs> this week, I was like, well, well hopefully this has been somewhat helpful. Oh, it's been it's been great. Yeah, I spent all week trying to figure out which one of these things I wanted to kind of hit on when I knew when I knew had you coming on, and I was like, I don't, I don't know. You can talk about one and not <laughs> talk about the other. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's, you, yeah, it's crazy. Definitely a crazy time. Definitely a crazy. Yeah, time. this is right. something that, that farmers talk about in coffee shops for the next few uh, decades. I think it'll be. Good conversation, at least. <laughs> Something to yeah, talk about. No, no doubt about it. it. No doubt about it. All right, Tanner. Well, I guess if folks want to reach out to you um, and, and kind of get some more information from you, or just follow along with what you're uh, what you're putting out, what's the best way for them to to follow you or or see what you uh, some of the some of the white papers and stuff you guys yeah. put out? Well, they can uh, go to our website at cobank dot com, and uh, that's where we uh, post our research. And the knowledge exchange research is right there on the uh, on the website, very easily accessible. You can also follow uh, any of the Cobank economists, and myself included, on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. We're regular; uh, we have regular po- regularly posting uh, on those platforms. Uh, so, uh, and then you can also contact us through any of those uh, means uh, through the websites, through our website, or uh, through through social media. Right on. Right on. Well, that's a. Uh, I love reading your stuff. I love listening, watching your tweets and stuff like that. Because there's there's so many, so much good information there that that helps kind of direct kind of what what things are happening and how things are going and really dissect what's happening out there. So, Tanner, I really appreciate you being on the podcast. Well, I'm glad to do it. Thanks for having me, Casey. Um, I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Make sure to check me out on all my social media at Moving Iron LLC, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Also, uh, check out um, Global Ag Network and the great podcasters on there as well. So until next time, I'm Casey Seymour with Tanner MP of CoBank. Let's go move some iron, folks. Out. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Time and time again Through the years you
you'll find us here moving higher.